It's June 6, 2001, Los Angeles, California. Last minute of overtime in game one of the NBA Finals between the reigning champion Lakers and the Philadelphia 76ers. LA is definitely gonna win this series. Nobody in their right mind would predict otherwise. But right now, Philly's up two points. Allen Iverson has the ball and the opportunity to all but decide this opening game in favor of the underdog Sixers. This moment has the potential to transcend the overall series outcome in NBA history. To fully understand why, we need to trace the paths these people took to get here and grasp the incredible unlikeliness that they even made it this far. Let's rewind. So, these teams entered the playoffs with the same record, but they are not particularly alike. This Lakers squad is an absolute buzzsaw. Last season, they won a remarkable 67 regular season games, then had to scratch and claw through close playoff series to eventually win Kobe Bryant and league MVP Shaquille O'Neal their first championship. This year has been the inverse. Even among rumors of a Shaq-Kobe feud, LA won 56 games, great but not incredible, but they finished the regular season on an eight-game win streak to clinch their division, then just mercilessly plowed through playoff opponents. They swept the Blazers, swept the Kings, they even swept the one-seed Spurs, and at no point was any of this close. They took those 11 straight playoff victories by an average margin of 15 points. Shaq has looked as dominant as ever, so has Kobe, and their supporting cast, dudes like Derek Fisher, Rick Fox, and the recently acquired Horace Grant, has run Coach Phil Jackson's triangle offense brilliantly. Ask any expert and they'll pick the Lakers to repeat as champions. Same with the odds makers. As far as gambling is concerned, LA is the most heavily favored NBA Finals team ever. And they open this game one by reminding everyone why they're a historically safe bet. Thanks in large part to Fox's shooting and Shaq's sheer force on the inside, LA fired off a 16-0 run in the first quarter. By now, O'Neal has a commanding 44 points, which of course leaves one wondering how the Sixers are winning the game. Because the Sixers, they did not coast into this series like the Lakers did. Far, far from it. Just looking at this lineup on the floor gives you hints of how much the Sixers have changed this season and how many obstacles they faced. Let's start in the middle. This is Dikembe Mutombo. Four months ago, he wasn't a Sixer. In February, Philadelphia was rolling. They had the best record in the NBA with an elite defense anchored by center Theo Ratliff, who'd been selected alongside Allen Iverson for the All-Star game later that month. But on February 7th, disaster struck. In their last game before the All-Star break, Philly got smoked by Steve Francis and the Houston Rockets. And worse, Ratliff aggravated a wrist injury that was later shown to be a stress fracture. It would require surgery and sideline him for quite a while. Gunning for a number one seed and a deep playoff run, the Sixers didn't have that kind of time. And as it happened, the miserable Atlanta Hawks were ready to trade their star defensive center, Matumbo. They didn't mind taking the injured Ratliff in return, but demanded another key Sixer, Tony Kukoc, to get a deal done. It was a big swing for the Sixers to take, and though Philly wasn't quite as dominant after the All-Star break, Matumbo did win Defensive Player of the Year, and he's been a crucial part of this playoff run right up through tonight. It's not like Dikembe has slowed down Shaq. Nobody does that. But at the very least, Mutombo walled off the rim to penetrators, made Shaq work on the other end, and put some good hard playoff fouls on the big guy. Five of them, in fact. Guarding Shaq is frustrating, but it'd be way tougher if the Sixers had just stood pat with an injured Ratliff on their roster. And we can't talk about injuries without discussing these three guys, each of whom has guarded Kobe Bryant tonight. They've done a good job, too. Thanks in large part to Eric Snow's quick hands, Aaron McKee's poise on the block, and Raja Bell's fearless ball hawking, Kobe has as many turnovers as baskets so far. But it took a lot for any of these three guys to end up on the floor right now. The tough road the Sixers faced after the Ratliff injury didn't end in the regular season. During the second round of the playoffs against the Raptors, key wing defender George Lynch aggravated a fracture in his left foot. He hasn't played since. In the following round against the Bucks, Snow, another lockdown defender, broke his foot, fracturing the bone around the screw that had been surgically implanted in his ankle months prior. And amazingly, yet another defensive specialist broke his foot tonight. It hasn't been diagnosed yet, but when sixth man of the year Aaron McKee came up limping in the fourth quarter, 
it was because of a chip fracture in his right ankle. The key is struggling, you can see. So yeah, lots of broken feet, on the court and stuck on the sideline. Oh, and Matumbo has a broken finger he suffered in the conference finals, and Iverson, we'll get to Iverson. The point for now is these Sixers are absurdly wounded, which explains why this guy is on the court at all. Raja Bell is on the floor in crunch time of a finals game, and he is nobody. Or at least he was nobody. Bell went undrafted out of Florida International University in 1999. He spent a season with the Yakima Sun Kings of the CBA. The Spurs signed him before this season, but played him literally zero minutes, then cut him. Philly snagged Bell right before the playoffs as injury insurance, and obviously they have needed injury insurance. Tonight, he's been an instrumental part of the brigade assigned to Kobe. He's made some big plays in transition, and he pulled off this truly inspired feat of pivoting to cut into a small Lakers lead a few minutes ago. So I guess my point is this. The playoffs have been so punishing that the Sixers are trying to close out a finals game with two broken feet, a broken finger, a guy who started playing NBA basketball months ago, and, well, we'll get to Iverson's performance in the playoffs. I first want to make clear that Allen Iverson wasn't supposed to be here, like, for any of this. The fact that he's even on the team right now has a lot to do with Matt Geiger. Yes, Matt Geiger, the tall, bald dude who comes off the bench behind Matumbo and who's played some solid minutes tonight. He splashed mid-range jumpers while Matumbo sat with foul trouble before fouling out himself because, like we've established, guarding Shaq is pretty hard. How is a random bench player crucial to Iverson's continued presence in Philly? Well, let's go back a year, summer 2000. The Sixers were coming off kind of a fraught season, with the main problem being continued conflict between Iverson and coach Larry Brown. Iverson had drawn Brown's ire and eventually a team suspension by skipping practice and being late for practice. It feels good for some reason to repeat that word like that. Practice. Practice. What were we talking about? Oh, right, we were talking about practice. The coach-star relationship got so bad that by the offseason, all parties were openly questioning the future. Iverson said continuing to play for Brown would be extremely hard. Brown mulled an offer to coach at his alma mater, the University of North Carolina, despite having just signed an extension in Philly. And after Brown ultimately passed on the UNC job, the Sixers moved to get rid of Iverson. They didn't just come close to making that decision, they made it. Sixers owner Pat Croce engineered a complex four-team trade. According to reports, it would have sent Iverson and Geiger to Detroit, Jerry Stackhouse, Christian Leitner, and Travis Knight to Charlotte, and Anthony Mason, Todd Fuller, and Philly's Kukoc to the Lakers. For surrendering their superstar, Philly would have come away with Eddie Jones, Glenn Rice, Jerome Williams, and Dale Ellis. The deal was close enough to Dunn that Croce called Iverson to let him know, but it was convoluted enough that any little moving part could foil it, and one did. Geiger's contract had a trade kicker, a 15% raise in salary if he got dealt, that he'd have to waive to make the four-team swap work under the salary cap. Geiger refused. He didn't want to go to Detroit. So, Allen Iverson didn't go to Detroit. He stayed a Sixer, and perhaps thanks to facing down a near breakup, the relationship between Iverson and Brown healed. And here Iverson still is, hoping to be the hero for the Sixers. And you know what? I think it's time to finally, fully address the question I asked before. The Lakers are unstoppable. They're cruising. The Sixers made a huge midseason trade, and they've suffered innumerable injuries over their grueling playoff run. How the hell are they here on the verge of stealing game one? The answer is the answer. Allen Iverson has done everything. He is everything. Iverson was this season's scoring champion, averaging 31 points per game. No other Sixer averaged more than 12. Iverson also led the league in minutes per game and steals per game, which helped win him the most valuable player vote by a wide margin. A pretty poetic outcome after he stole a single solitary first place vote from Shaq's otherwise unanimous 2000 MVP award. By the way, quick aside to acknowledge that I've mentioned a bunch of awards, haven't I? MVP for Iverson, six man for McKee, defensive player of the year for Matumbo, and guess what? Brown won coach of the year too. All that for one team in the same season has never happened before. But yeah, the star around which all those people orbit is definitely Iverson. The Sixers would be nowhere without him. It was clear in the regular season and even clearer throughout this gauntlet of a playoff run. 
While the Lakers laughed through a breezy 11 straight wins, the Sixers fought uphill from the very beginning. Philly dropped game one of the first round against the eight seed Pacers because of this last second three pointer by Reggie Miller. So Iverson took over, scoring 110 points over the next three games to get the Sixers out of the series. Next round, the Toronto Raptors, featuring one of the only people on earth capable of matching Iverson's production on any given night. And so he did. Vince Carter scored 35 to Iverson's 36 to open the series, and the Raptors stole game one in Philadelphia. Iverson responded by hanging 54 on the Raptors, and his team needed all of it. Snow was the only other Sixer to even score in double figures, but Philly secured a close game two victory. At home in Toronto for game three, Carter came firing right back, dropping 50 in a blowout Raptors win. Iverson struggled a bit during game four, but got a boost from Matumbo and McKee and hit a big late three to help the Sixers tie the series. And in game five, AI turned right back into the MVP with 52 points on just 32 shots in a blowout win. Toronto evened things back up in game six, and by game seven, Iverson was running on fumes and hurting badly after falling hard on his already injured left hip. But Carter blew his chance to be a hero. He made headlines by attending his college graduation in North Carolina the morning of game seven, then he went cold from the field throughout the game itself. But with time winding down, Carter had the ball with everything on the line, got a pretty good look at the series winning shot, and just missed it long at the buzzer. The Sixers survived the Eastern Conference semifinals by the narrowest of margins. The Sixers hold on and advance to the conference finals. Next battle, Milwaukee Bucks in the Eastern Conference Finals. Iverson put up 34 in a game one win, but the hip and a bruised tailbone started to bother him. He shot poorly and was outplayed by Milwaukee's Ray Allen in a game two loss. The pain got bad enough that Iverson sat for game three. Philly competed valiantly, but fell behind in the series without their star. Iverson didn't play great upon returning for games four and five, and on top of his pre-existing conditions, got a tooth knocked out. Matumbo, though, stepped up big time to help the Sixers swing the series back in their favor. And then there's game six. Game six didn't look like a big deal on paper. The Bucks won by a pretty wide margin to send the series to a decisive game seven. But it was big for other reasons. Reason one is that Iverson woke up. The Sixers got humiliated in the first half. Ray Allen went on a 17-0 run by himself. Ray Allen up for three. <laughs> and Milwaukee led by as much as 33. But for whatever reason, Brown left some of his exhausted starters on the floor late in the game, and they nearly came back. Iverson fully shook out of his funk for a ridiculous 26-point fourth quarter. And the Sixers lost game six by just 10 points. Another reason game six mattered is that the Bucks had been battling the refs all series long. Glenn Robinson, who'd been ejected in game four, complained about the foul differential. Ray Allen complained that officials had missed a goal 10 by Matumbo on his final attempt to win game five. Allen even came right out and said the league was hoping to put the Sixers in the finals. He and coach George Carl complained so much that they'd eventually get fined. And in game six, Milwaukee's conspiracy theory got a little more fodder. Starting power forward Scott Williams put a kind of hard foul on Iverson, and after the game, it was surprisingly upgraded to a flagrant two, which led to Williams' suspension for game seven. So Iverson's slump was busted, the grumpy bucks were depleted, and as a result, Philly owned game seven. And that is how Allen Iverson got the Sixers into this game one. And now he has a chance to get them out of it. That itself is kind of a miracle. While the Lakers went on that big early run, Iverson was cold. He missed four of his first five shots and coughed up a couple unfortunate turnovers against the defense of Kobe and Derek Fisher. But at the end of that first quarter, he came alive, sparked by some transition opportunities and a couple J's from one of his pet spots just inside the arc on the baseline. From there, AI just took over. Fisher couldn't hang and all the LA big guys could do was foul him. Iverson finished with 30 points in the first half, five short of Michael Jordan's record for a finals half. That gave him exactly 100 points over the last seven quarters going back to the Bucks series. Iverson was on one. That said, after his 30 point first half, Iverson has only 46 points here in overtime. Relatively speaking, he has slowed down. That's because Phil Jackson tried something different. This guy. The Lakers picked up Teron Liu on draft night 98, but they've barely used him since. Lou played a total of just 61 regular season games in his first three years, 
and had no role in the 2000 championship run. Lou barely made this year's playoff roster, earning the last spot over the injured and disgruntled Isaiah Ryder. The most minutes he's played in any of these Laker playoff games is 11, and that was on a night LA beat the Spurs by 39 points. Lou's main role heading into this series was to impersonate Iverson against LA's first unit defense in practice since he's little and quick like the Sixers star. But what if instead of being Iverson, Lou could beat Iverson? Coach Jackson put his back up on the floor in the middle of the third quarter, and Lou made him look brilliant. The Lakers have stuck with him. His quick feet allowed him to put a ton of pressure on Iverson, either nagging him into turnovers and tough shots, or just forcing the ball away from him as part of super aggressive double teams. Lou had the announcers gushing over his outstanding defense just a few minutes ago. Iverson will be dreaming about Jerron Lou tonight. And I'm pretty sure when the PA system asked who let the dogs out, the crowd responded with Teron's last name. The double zeroes up there, shot clock violation. And... The only reason Philly has this two point lead is because Lou fell down on offense a minute ago, allowing Iverson to line up an open three at the other end. And now, here we are. Two point game. The man with the ball has been battered all playoffs long, but he's been playing up to his MVP status in spite of it. The man standing in his way is getting the first real playoff minutes of his career, and he's made the most of them so far. Around Iverson is the wreckage of three controversial, debilitating playoff series before this. Broken bones and bench warmers pressed into action. Some of these guys weren't even around a couple months ago, and Iverson himself might not be around if not for the choices of a middling role player. In any event, these Lakers are a powerhouse defending champion, very, very unlikely to surrender this series. But just for now, just for tonight, Iverson has a chance to put game one out of reach. A bucket here would cement an iconic, isolated moment in what should otherwise be a series loss for these massive underdogs. Okay, let's watch. Welcome to a moment in history. Iverson. Steps over Kobe hit a big shot right after that, but the Sixers did indeed win game one and then obviously lose the series. If you want to learn about the next team that tried to challenge the Lakers, here's an episode of Collapse about the New Jersey Nets. Or if you want to learn about a feud between two of the people mentioned in this video, here's a Kobe Ray Allen beef history. <laughs> 